for the first time, it's great to have you here. What a privilege it is to gather with you in worship of our Lord, to be reminded of who God is and what His Son accomplished on the cross for us. In Isaiah, we read, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And now every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, oh there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you.
Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. And there's salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we can be saved. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, to the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever.
we recognize that you are worthy and above all things. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the Alpha and the Omega. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you, to be in your presence. Thank you for the work that you're doing in our hearts, in our lives. Bless this time as we learn from your word, we ask in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Feel free to grab a seat. Welcome to Village Church, everyone. My name is Fanu, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Village. And uh, if you are new with us, a special welcome to you across all of our locations and online. Uh, we are launching a brand new series today called Lies. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to deal with the lies of culture in uh, three different areas, in religion, uh, in, with uh, the, the topic of sex and image. So religion, sex, and image. And today, uh, we're going to deal with uh, religion. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 17. And uh, starting from verse 22. So if you have your Bibles, uh, open up your Bibles on your devices, or if you don't have a Bible, you can always pick one up uh, just outside the doors at all of our locations. Um, Acts chapter 17, verse 22. In fact, before I read this scripture, I want to sort of set the framework of what I'm going to talk about today, and I'll uh, sort of start off with a story. Uh, so about a year ago, I was going out to a conference in Chicago, and uh, so uh, it was an early morning flight, 6 a.m. flight from Toronto, so I get to the airport at like 4.30 in the morning, get on the plane at 6 a.m., get to Chicago, go get, uh, get in an Uber, get to the conference center. Um, and uh, so it's been a, you know, a really early morning for me. And so I get there and then there's a registration uh, set up. And of course, it's based on last names. And so it's like, you know, A to E, F to J, K to O, all of that. And so I line up, you know, my last name is Ipe, as you know. So um, I, la I line up in that section and I get to the front and I say to the lady, she's like, what's your name? I said, it's Fanu Ipe. Now, some of you know this already about me. I have a difficult time with my name. People just cannot uh, get their minds around around my name, either in pronunciation of my name or sometimes the spelling of my name. My friends were recently actually surprised to find out that I have a Starbucks name. I have a name I use just for Starbucks. So if you ever serve me coffee at Starbucks, you're like, wait, I think I know this guy. He's Pastor Fanu. But on, at Starbucks, I'm Finn. I am, because I'm just like, I'm just tired. of like, what is it again? How do I spell, you know? So anyways, so I get there. I'm like, my name is Fanu Ipe. And so she's looking for Ipe, 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 Ipe. Nope, it's not there. She's looking, looking, looking. She can't find it. She's like, sir, are you sure you registered? I said, I know I registered. I'm trying to find the email registration confirmation, whatever. And then all of a sudden it clicks, because this is like the main of my existence. Every single time I fill out an online form, and someone has to take the information on that form and write my name out, for some reason, they take the uppercase, I and they think it's a lowercase that's right. You guys know what I'm talking about. So it's a lowercase L. So I'm like, oh, I think this is, I know, I think I know what happened. So I said to her, actually, can you check under L, please? So they're like, she's talking to the lady at the L section and she, she's looking for my name. And sure enough, L, 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 I was there. Fanu Lipe. Okay, so I explained to them the whole thing, and they're like, I'm so sorry, sir, we don't know how this happened, blah, 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 blah. They were very super apologetic, and of course, uh, they, they, they turned the L into, a, into an I, and, uh, and was all good. But here's the thing, they were looking for the right thing, but they were looking for it in the wrong place. So when we talk about life, what we're talking about is not about the, the curiosity, the, the heart, the passion, the, dis, the, the, the desire to discover and explore. We're talking about, are you looking for the right things? but are you looking for them in the wrong places? And so Acts chapter 17 and verse 22 says this. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Paul is standing in the midst of the Areopagus. He's standing in Athens. He's standing at this place where there was debate of philosophy and culture and religion and all kinds of new ideas were being debated at this place. And he's standing there. I love this about Paul, just that posture, this idea of a man who comes with a message, who comes from another place, another, another um, geographical location, another culture. But he comes confident that what he has to share, what he has to give this culture, what he has 
has to give this community is worth their time, is worth their interest, is worth the debate, it's worth the back and forth, because he believes the information he has, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ came into this world, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for the sins of mankind, and rose from the grave, and promises eternal life, that that message is worth debating, it's worth talking about, that it is what will ultimately lead to human flourishing. That's the posture of the Christian church. I talk to people all the time. I'm like, listen, if you really believe in the gospel, you'll want to talk about it. Because if you really believe it's true and you really believe it's the answer to the problems of the world, then why wouldn't you want everyone around you to know? It's like me. You guys know I love a deal. If you're my friend and you don't tell me a deal that you got and you didn't tell me about it, don't tell me you got the deal. Just tell me it was full price because I'll be upset at you. I'm like, bro, why didn't you send me the discount code? Right? And Paul believes that. See, this is the, the whole idea of the Great Commission before Jesus ascends. He says, go into the world. Why do we do series like this at Village? Some of you are probably like, oh man, we're, we're talking about these controversial topics. Why do, we have to, why do we have to frame it this way, package it this way? Of course, we're just teaching the Bible, but why do we have to do it this way? You know why? Because we want to present the ideas of the Christian faith in the marketplace of ideas in Canada. Because we believe as a church that the gospel of Jesus is the hope of the world, is the hope of our nation, will transform our cities, our towns, our, nation, our, our provinces, and our nation. The question is, do you believe that? If you do, you're going to want to talk about it. Now he says this. Watch this. Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Now before I talk about people that are religious, let me also say this. If you are someone that's an atheist or an agnostic here, and you're like, Fanu, I don't even know if I believe in God, the idea of God, the idea of faith. Um, I want to challenge you to consider. Consider taking time to study and understand and learn. One philosopher put it this way. He said, two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration um, and awe. The more often and steadily we reflect upon them, the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. The philosophers all through the centuries have struggled with this. Yes, I want to just take the natural world for what it is. But then I see something in me when I look at the starry skies. When I look at the universe around me, something happens in me that wants to praise someone that wants to glorify someone for the beauty of creation. When I look at my own heart, I see in me something that's beyond just animalistic tendencies. There's something in me that's not just about my self-fulfillment. I, I tend to care about right and wrong, about good and evil, about light and darkness. A couple of things I want to present to you that I think will be helpful, just, just, just if you're curious about this. Number one, why do I think there is a place for God? in the conversation in culture. Number one is cosmos. When you look at the world, it's sort of universally accepted that everyone says the universe had a beginning point. If the universe had a beginning point, of course, there's no valid evidence scientifically that we can provide because it's many, many, many billions of years ago. There's theories like the multiverse, which from my perspective take just as much faith as believing in anything else. But if you had to have a beginning for something that is uh, limited, like the universe in space, time, and is material, then it had to be someone that is outside of space, outside of time, that is immaterial, that is personal, because he had to have the desire to create it and had to be intelligent because we see his design in the universe. That's part of the idea of who God is. He's outside of space and time. He's immaterial, he's personal, he's intelligent. It's like finding a watch in a forest. You don't find a watch in a forest and say, well, I suppose time and chance just made this happen. We naturally think there had to be somebody that put this together. C.S. Lewis says this, supposing there was no intelligence behind the universe, no creative mind. In that case, nobody designed my brain for the purpose of thinking. It is merely that when the atoms inside my skull uh, happen, uh, inside my skull happen for physical or chemical reasons to arrange themselves in a certain way, this gives me as a byproduct the sensation I call thought. But if so, how can I trust my own thinking to be true? It's like upsetting a milk jug and hoping that the way it splashes itself will give you a map of London. But if you can't trust, if I can't trust my own thinking, of course I can't trust the arguments leading to atheism and therefore have no reason to be an atheist or anything else. Unless I believe in God, I cannot believe in thought, so I can never use the thought to disbelieve God. 
Number two, biology. Listen, there's 30, 40 trillion cells in your body. Each of those cells has DNA, right? It's like three billion plus letters in sequence. Think about that for a moment. So the question is, can you really say there was no one behind that? Like if you walked by a beach, let's say you went to Crescent Beach or something here, and, and on the sand, it says John loves Mary Hart. Do you walk by with your friends and say, whoa, the waves at Crescent Beach are smart. We got some intelligent waves here at this beach. No, you naturally assume that somebody did that. Someone with intelligence did that. And the third is, as the philosopher said, is the, the moral argument. I, I heard the story of this man. His name is uh, uh, Wesley Autry. In January, of, uh, January 2nd, 2007, he was standing at a New York subway platform um, and uh, with his two daughters and uh, a couple other women around him and there's this guy next to him and uh, the guy, his name is Cameron, has a, a seizure. He falls to the ground, he has a seizure um, and uh, uh, Wesley jumps in to help him and, uh, and, and helps him out and the guy gets up but as he gets up, he falls into the tracks. He falls into the tracks and Wesley in an instant, in a moment, he jumps onto the tracks trying to save Cameron. But then once he gets onto the tracks, he realizes there's no way he's going to get this guy out, off the tracks in time because the train's coming. And so he gets him to lay flat on the, between the tracks and he lays on top of him to protect him. And the train goes over them. The next day, I mean, they're getting scholarships for their kids. He's getting money. Walt Disney gave him a trip to Disney World. And, and, and Beyonce gave him uh, tickets to his car concert and backstage passes. And, and Jeep gave them a free SUV. And Progressive gave them free insurance for two years. And New York City said you can park for free anywhere in the city. And, and, and they gave his daughters computers, brand new computers. And they said every three years we'll give you new ones until you graduate high school. They got, he got a medal from New York City. Why? Why, why, why do that? If it's just a bunch of cells that in an instant, for whatever reason, jumped onto a platform, onto a train track, why would you honor that? Why would you treat that man any different from the guy that pushes someone onto the tracks? If there's no right and wrong. But where does it come? If you say, well, there is right and wrong, well, then where does that come from? If all we are is a bunch of cells, where does it come from? How do, how do you say that Mother Teresa and Hitler are just both good people with different preferences? So the moral argument is obvious. I'm not saying for you to believe in a God, but for you to explore the idea there's got to be something more than this natural world. And then Paul begins to talk now, and he begins to unpack in verse 22, he says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. The first lie of culture is that Christianity is all about a bunch of religious practices. Do good and be blessed. Do bad and you are in trouble. And I get it. I get why we would come to that conclusion because so many of us have maybe grown up in the church and have grown up in legalistic settings where it's always about outward appearance and not inward transformation. And so you're following rules, but there's no change in, on the inside. You're watching people who act very religious and pious in church, but their lives actually don't match up. We see the inconsistencies in our ho own homes and families. I talk to so many of you in our church. We come from backgrounds. I come from backgrounds like this. So, of course, we have a whole movement in our generation of deconstruction, which in some ways can be a good thing if it's based on deconstructing all the human-made stuff of religion and saying, hey, what is the true understanding of what Scripture asks you to do and how you ought to live? It's like I talked to a guy the other day. He was talking about this religious, Christian religious experience, legalism and all of this, and he was like, you know, it's funny because he's like, uh, we were told on Sundays you cannot go watch the movies. You can't go to the movies. But when they did go to the movies during the week, his parents would go like, can you tell them you're 11 and not 12 so we can get the discounted price? <laughs> right? So all of a sudden, as a kid, you're like, wait, well, I don't get this. How does this work? But the truth is this. You may be turned off because you're like, oh, man, I got to do all these things to qualify for God. But the truth is that God loves you already. 
That's what the scripture teaches. Uh, the Bible says in Luke chapter 15 and 20, and he arose and came to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, ran and embraced him, kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again and he was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Can you imagine a son that took the inheritance of his father and destroyed it? He was literally living with the pigs, eating the scraps from the pig pen. And then now he's coming to his father. I'm sure he stunk. I'm sure he didn't look so good. But the father doesn't care. The father didn't say, go take a shower. Go get changed before I can embrace you. He says, no, I will look past the outward appearance that you have because I still love you as my son. That's the gospel message. That you may not be clean yet, but God loves you still. I was talking to a, a couple of people in our church in the lobby a few weeks ago. There was a daughter and a mother. The daughter had been coming for a while to our church, and the mother had just started coming uh, more recently. And we were just talking about how they were enjoying uh, coming to church and learning the word and being in worship and all of this. And, and halfway through the conversation, the mom uh, just started breaking down and just tearing up. And she was talking about how for so long she wouldn't want to come to church because of stuff that had happened in her past. And she told me what it was. And yes, it would be things that people would judge someone for. And then she says, I didn't even want to come to church because I felt like I wasn't good enough to come. I wasn't good enough to stand with people or be around people who come to church. And I'm like, no, that's not true. The whole point of the Christian faith, the whole point of the community we create here at Village is we want people who don't feel worthy to go anywhere else in culture to find a safe place to come and be loved and be in community and hear the gospel and let Jesus transform their lives. That's why we show up here. We're not an exclusive club. The church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a museum for saints. But here's the truth of the message of Jesus. You are welcome to come to Christ just as you are. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from or what you've done or how bad you've been, who's rejected you or who's given up on you or how worthy you feel about yourself or not. The truth is of the gospel is that you are known. You are loved. You are accepted. I want you to hear this. You are accepted. You can be made new. You can have new life. You can have infinite grace. You can have eternal purpose. And you can have an inheritance of joy and peace and hope that nothing and no one in this world can rob from you your life. That's the message of Jesus. Tim Keller puts it this way. He says, think of people you consider fanatical. They're overbearing, self-righteous, opinionated, insensitive, and harsh. Why? It's not because they are too Christian. It's because they are not Christian enough. They are fanatically zealous and courageous, but they are not fanatically humble, sensitive, loving, empathetic, forgiving, or understanding as Christ was. What strikes us as overly fanatical is actually a failure to be fully committed to Christ and his gospel. And maybe some of us who call ourselves Christians need to repent for being judgmental, for treating people differently because of something on the outside. You know, it's funny, my daughter, you know, it's a good thing to take your kids to church and teach them the Bible, but sometimes it sort of backfires, okay? <laughs> my five-year-old is having a conversation with her mom a few months ago, and she had not been nice to her three-year-old sister. Lauren is the older one, and uh, Trisha's like, Lauren, that wasn't nice. You shouldn't speak to your sister that way. You shouldn't treat her that way. You should be kind to her. You should be gentle with her. She's your little sister. And so she's giving her all this, and you know, just to add Christian parents through this all time, just to add a little bit more effect. Trisha goes on and says, you know, you know, Jesus, she prays to Jesus, she loves Jesus, she reads the Bible, all that. You know, Jesus would not be happy with you if you treat your sister that way. My daughter listens very carefully and then responds to her mother and says, yes, mommy, I understand. But just so you know, mama, Jesus already forgave me. I'm like, oh, too much gospel, too much gospel. Okay, too much gospel sometimes. Here's the point, here's the point. God wants, the truth of the gospel is God wants to, you to know him. This is the whole point of the, of, the, of the coming of Jesus. Hebrews chapter one and verse one and two says this, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things, though whom also, through him, whom he also, he created the world. God is speaking through his son. 
Christianity is not just a series of truths to be believed in, John Stott says. It's primarily a relationship to be experienced. It's not just a moral code to be followed. It's a life to be lived. It's like, you know, if you watch Interstellar, right? One of my favorite movies of all time, right? And in the last scene of Interstellar, when, when um, Matthew McConaughey's character, he is in, uh, Connor, he's in, uh, uh, in the fourth dimension, right? And he's trying to communicate to his daughter, Murph. Right? And, and, and he's trying to uh, communicate through Morse code and he's at the back of that bookshelf and he's trying to use uh, the bookshelf and all that, the sand and the timepiece and all that to communicate to her. She, he's banging on the door. He's desperate. He wants to get information to her so she can save herself and save her world. That's what Jesus is doing. He's knocking on the door of your heart. He's not distant. He's not far. He's not removed as culture says. You don't have to do a whole bunch of stuff. What you do have to do is say, Lord, I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to listen to what you have to say. Religion versus grace. Listen, it's not your grit. It's the grace of God. It's not your strength. It's the spirit of God. It's not creating an impression of piety. It's experiencing transformation for yourself. I love how the apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians 3, 16 and 17. He says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being. Guys, let me tell you, in Eastern religion and mysticism, you have to leave your family. You have to climb up on mountains. You have to go to ashrams. You have to fast. You have to meditate. You have to take vows of silence to experience God. But the Bible says in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God comes comes and lives inside of you, not because of your work, but because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Come on. Christianity is not a religion. It's the proclamation of the end of religion. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, truth is this, that knowing Jesus brings transformation. Knowing Jesus. That's what matters. Paul is speaking to the Athenians and he's saying all of the religious stuff will not change you. You got to know him. In Acts 2.37, when the, when the early first, first group of people who heard the gospel said, what shall we do to be saved? If there was a whole bunch of rules, if it was don't watch these movies, don't listen to this music, don't go there, don't do that, don't hang out with these people, that's what Peter would have said. But that's not what he said. Listen to what he said. He says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what you need to do. Is turn from sin, turn to Christ. Can I, can I encourage you, church, village? It's happening. It's happening all over our church. I hear stories. I hear all the time of people whose lives, I was talking to a young man, he DM'd me the other day on Instagram, he said, Pastor Fanu, I want to be baptized. So I called him up, and I started talking to him, I said, tell me your story. He said, well, I started coming to church for the first time. He used to worship all these different religious, religious idols and, and all of this stuff, and he says, I came to the church for, to the church for the first time about, I think, about two years ago. And about a, about a year and a half or a year ago, he, he finally gave his life to Christ, which, by the way, can I highlight? That's beautiful. I love it when people come, and they 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 come. They've come 10 times, they're still not Christians. That's great. That's what we want. We don't want you to just like accept something just because you heard one sermon. We want you to think about it. We want you to ask, can I really give my life to this? He says, eventually I gave my life. And he says, a year, year and a half ago, I gave my life to Jesus. And he says, you won't believe it. My life has changed. He says, my family, my, my marriage has been transformed. My business is transformed. My life is transformed. He says, I used to go to these idols and worship and nothing was happening in my life. But he says, Pastor Fanu, you won't believe what's going on now. My life is being transformed by Jesus. Come on, hallelujah. See, that's the stories. That's the testimony that we want. That Jesus is doing it even today. And now he's ready to be baptized. He wants to take the next step of commitment. Verse 26, and he made the one from one, every nation, this is Paul again speaking, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries for their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of you, your own poets, have said, for we are indeed his offspring. See, here's the lie of culture. Religion, Christianity, 
is for certain people from certain places at certain times. It's not for everyone. It's not for the world. It's a lie. The number one thing, when I talk to people of different faiths or different cultures, they say to me, oh, Pastor Fino, oh, it's so good to hear about this. But you know, I grew up in this culture. I grew up in this religious tradition. In fact, when I first came to Canada, the number one question I asked from, pe get asked from people is, like, where are you from? I said, well, I'm from Bahrain. I was born there. My parents are originally from India. They said, oh, that's so surprising. I said, what is surprising? That you are a Christian pastor and you're from India. I said, why is that surprising? By the way, just in case you don't know, I think they say 10 or 15% of the Indian population is Christian and they have 1.5 billion people. So just do the math, okay? There's a lot of Christians there too, right? But here's my point. It's this, it's this narrow-minded perspective. Yes, I get it. In certain cultures, you can change. What you were born into is what you've got to die as. You don't even have the freedom. Your parents don't say, hey, explore, discover, study, learn, understand. I was... Um, at um, BC Children's Hospital uh, the other day praying for someone with one of our pastors and on the way out, down in the hallway, a nurse passed us by, turned around and called out my name. Fanu, is that, is that you? And I said, yes, it's, it's me. And, you know, so we never met before, but she comes to our church. She's been coming recently. And she was explaining to me how much she's enjoyed being at church. And part of what her comment to me was, it finally makes sense. It finally relates and connects to my life. The thing I was going to before, it wasn't really helping. It wasn't, I wasn't really understanding. But this is more relatable. See, part of the Christian gospel message is this, that God in Jesus became flesh, became man. Why? He wants to connect to you. He understands who you are. He understands your emotions. He understands your pain. He understands all of the things you deal with in life. Here's the truth. Everyone is welcome to come to Jesus. The New Testament talks about a transnational kingdom. It's not about one culture, one ethnicity, one race, one language group, one tribe. The idea of the Christian faith, even though it's exclusive. This is the fascinating thing about Christianity. Christianity is exclusive in that you have to believe in Jesus. But in the early Roman culture, Christians were the most inclusive people. The Greeks and the Romans never, they didn't, they didn't mix the rich and the poor. The Jews wouldn't mix the races. But, but Christians did. They, they invited everyone in. And you wonder why? Well, because if Jesus is the ultimate reality, if Jesus is the, is the visible representation of how we ought to live our life, how did Jesus live his life? How did Jesus end his life? The ultimate Christian reality for a, for a Christian is a man on a cross, loving people who don't love him, forgiving people who are abusing him, sacrificially serving people who oppose him. When early Christians look into the very heart of their life, that's the ultimate reality. How can they coerce? How can they trample? How could they be cruel to anyone? They couldn't be. If you take it to the center of your life, you can't be either. Here's what he's saying. The idea of the Christian faith, it's for everyone. Not just the gospel, but the effect of the gospel. The effect of the gospel. I, I, was, I was looking on um, social the other day, and a church that we worked with during the pandemic uh, in the Toronto area, at the time, they were, you know, everything was shut down. They were trying to find a way to serve their community. And so in partnership uh, with that church, we launched uh, a food hub, uh, like a sort of like a food bank in the area. And they didn't have a lot of resources. They didn't have a lot of stuff, but they had space, obviously, because the church was shut down. They couldn't have services. They had space, and they had a ton of volunteers. So they started serving food, and people started donating. You know what's amazing about it? It was not just Christians. It was so many non-Christians in the community, all kinds of people that were not connected to the church, not connected to the Christian faith, were donating to towards this mission. And so I saw the other day, now they're still doing it, what, three, four years later, and hundreds of people are receiving food in that community every single week. And the city and businesses and all kinds of provincial partnerships are happening for that church to make this a massive scale project to help people, obviously with inflation and everything that's happening in our country, to serve them. Here's the point. The Christian gospel makes it so that every person can experience the generosity of Jesus through his people. The lie is, oh, that's a Christian church. It's only for Christians. No, it isn't. It's for everyone who wants to hear. And it's generosity and it's love and it's care and it's provision is for everyone who lives in the community. That's why we do local city impact uh, initiatives. Why? Because all of our sites, we do it. Why? Because we want to make a difference in the neighborhood, in the community that we live in. Verse 29, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think of the divine being like, is like gold or silver or stone, 
an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Here's the lie, another lie of our culture, very prominent in Western culture is, if you want to be religious, just create your own gods. Make up your own gods. I love what uh, one writer says about this. Idols are not limited to primitive societies. There are many sophisticated idols. An idol is a god substitute. Any person or thing that occupies the place which God should occupy in is an idol. Fame, wealth, power, sex, food, alcohol, and other drugs. Parents, spouse, children, friends, work, and recreation. Like in Athens, they were literally manufacturing idols. This was a center of culture at the time. And all the cities and the regions around them were importing the idols of Athens. And that's sort of where we live in Vancouver, in Toronto, right? We worship the stuff around us. We worship the buildings. We worship the cars. We, we worship the lifestyle, right? I mean, we're just, I'm just moving to Vancouver now, obviously not fully settled in yet. But one of the things I realized for us here, right, as a new Vancouverite, I understand this temptation. I am so tempted, especially in the last few days, to worship the sun. I worship the sun. I said, yes, yes, the sun has come out and I want to worship it because when you go through so much rain and gray and dark times, you're just like, yes, give me more. How do I get you to come out more? How can I serve you? What sacrifice can I make, right? Like when we were buying a house, right? Uh, oh, by the way, thank you all for praying for us. Uh, I know many of you have been praying for us. We actually were able to buy a house. Um, it closes in a couple of months. And so uh, thank you for your prayers. And uh, keep praying for us as we're going back and forth across the country still. Um, so, you know, when we were buying the house, it was so hard, right? You, you see it in your heart because every time you go to a house, you know, I don't know, we, we went through, I don't know, maybe 100 homes, right? And, and online, maybe hundreds of homes. You're constantly, every day, House Sigma is sending me homes, right? Listings, right? So I'm looking at the, and the, and the realtors tell you, my brother's a realtor as well, they tell you, you know, Finu, when you walk into the house, you have to imagine yourself in this house. So this is what I'm trying to do. I imagine myself sitting in the study with all my books doing my sermon prep. I imagine myself in that nice soaker tub. We don't have this in the house in Toronto yet. But it's nice, deep soaker tub. Ooh, this is going to be so nice at the end of a tiring day. I can soak in this stuff. I, I, I imagine being out on the patio. Some of these homes had like patio decks with mountain views, right? This is like the BC dream, right? The mountain views. You're like, ooh, sitting with my wife with a cup of tea in the evening, you know, watching the, watching the beautiful mountains, right? You, you begin to imagine it, and before you know it, you're mesmerized by it. This, so now, all of a sudden, a house is not shelter anymore. Oh, no, no, no. It's not just about storing your stuff. Oh, no, no, it's not just that. It's not just about safe place for your families anymore. No, no. This is now the fulfillment of your life. If I can live in this community, in this neighborhood, if I can live in this kind of house, I'm going to feel, can you imagine how I feel about myself? Come on, you know what I'm talking about, right? If I'm in, the, some, some people are like, I said to some people, hey, I found a really nice house in this community. They say, no, 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 no. Do not go there. Do not go there, right? The house, but, the, but bro, the house is, once you walk into the house, it's perfect. It's just the outside. It's just the neighborhood. No, 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 don't live there, right? Because it's how it makes you feel. How proud are you going to be about it when you talk to people? This is, this is what we do, right? We, we go to our, we, we, you, maybe right now you work in a cubicle in your office space and you're not in a corner office yet. Every time you walk by the office, you're walking with your Bible in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that office is mine. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we use God for, to get our idols. You know, it's the, it's the corner office. So for some of us, it's that career. For some of us, it's that car. It's a big poster in the room. If I could just drive, can you imagine me driving that car? You know, all of you still ask me about a Mustang. I've never gotten a Mustang since. I just want you to know. Uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. Anyways, um, you know, you're driving the car. This is going to make me feel a certain way. Some of you, it's the dress. Come on, come on. You just be honest now. It's the dress. You look at that dress. Ooh, if I could wear that dress, if I could buy that dress, it would make, it's, the point is this, it's not about clothing. It's how it makes you feel. For some of you, it's not the dress. It's the body to get into the dress. This is my problem. I'm like, oh Lord, if I could have the body that can get into that dress, then I would feel so good about myself. Come on now, right? Like, like, like it's, it's like, and so, so it's funny because when I, with the whole house thing, eventually I had to get uh, home insurance. So I called for home insurance, and home insurance is exorbitant here. I was like, how is this possible? Five times what I pay in Toronto. So then I'm talking to the lady, and I'm like, how is this possible? It's so expensive. And she's like, oh, sir, it's because I've also included earthquake insurance. I said, what are you talking about? She says, no one told you? I was thinking about all of you. I'm telling you. I was thinking about all of you. I said, no, no one told me. No one told me that we're going to have a big one come at some point. And so my idol of this beautiful house is going to shake. 
and there's going to be cracks. And I, I can't even afford insurance for it. Right? I said, take it off. Take it off. I'll just pray. I'll just pray to Jesus. <laughs> Come on, many of you are doing the same thing. Just admit it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I got you. I know you. So, right? Right? The idols, like, the idols will shake. The earth will shake. The job will go. The body will break down. The, off, the company will shut down. Everything you put your hope in will one day fail. But here's the gospel message. Is there is one who you can build your life on. He is the rock of your salvation. And he will never fail. He will never shake. He will never move. And no one can ever pluck you out of his hand. That's the security we have in Jesus. Idols will always break the hearts of their worshipers. Idols will always promise things they can't deliver. Idols are false gods. They cannot bear the weight and the significance that we try to make them bear. The truth is this. Only Jesus can bear your sin and your brokenness. He's the only one that can and will and has already done that. In Isaiah 53, 3 to 7, I don't have time to read all of the, the, the verses here. But I read a couple here. Listen to this. It says, But it was for our sins that it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment that made us whole. Through his bruises we get healed. We're all like sheep who wandered off and got, had gotten lost. We've done, we've all done our own thing, gone our own way. And God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him. He was beaten, he was tortured, he didn't say a word. Like a lamb taken to the slaughter, and like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. And finally, Paul ends this section with this. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Here's the lie. There are many paths to God, just pick the one that's best for you. There's a parable of postmodernism, of a story of a king who looks at an elephant, and there's these six blind men that are holding on to this elephant. They all only have parts of the elephant. So the one guy is holding on to the trunk. He thinks it's round. He says it's like a snake. The other guy's holding on to the tusk. He feels it's sharp. He says it's like a spear. Another guy's holding on to uh, the leg, and he says it's tall. It's like a tree. They all come to their own conclusion. And the story, the, the meaning of the parable is supposed to be every religion only has a part of the truth. And so no one can claim to be exclusive. Leslie Newbegin, who was a missionary to India, had heard this story multiple times. And his response was this. But, he said, the one who makes the judgment that all religions can only have part of it is the one who claims to have the full view. The king in the story can see the entire elephant and hence can make the claim that everyone else can only see parts or only feel parts. So the one who says, do not make exclusive claims is in himself making an exclusive claim when he says, don't make exclusive claims. The reality is this. Every religion is different. In fact, Christianity stands against the world's religions in its view of salvation. Islam says the, talks about the five pillars. Hinduism talks about karma and reincarnation. Sikhism talks about the Guru Granth Sahib. It talks about the five Ks. It talks about meditating on the name of God, Why Guru. Uh, um, um, Buddhism talks about the eightfold noble path. They all talk about ways to get to God. But Christianity says, God has come to you. You don't have to try. You don't have to be reincarnated. I was listening to an evangelist who was talking to a businessman who became a Christian. And, and then he eventually, when he became a Christian, the evangelist said to him, said, why, what convinced you ultimately? He said, sir, I'm a businessman. When I borrow from the bank, and I take a loan, I know how much I've borrowed and how long it'll take me to pay. But he says, in the karmic cycle, no one can tell me how much of my sins I need to pay for, and no one can tell me how many rebirths I need to pay for it. This doesn't make any sense. Revelation 1, 17 and 18. The Apostle John has an encounter with the living, risen Savior, Jesus. 
When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and Hades, to death and hell. That's what the Christian faith offers. One who rose from the grave. That's what we celebrated at Easter. That's the only, that everything in the Christian faith relies on the resurrection of Jesus. And I'm not telling you to believe blindly, but I am saying to you, have you explored the evidence of the resurrection of Christ? If you haven't, do yourself a favor. Do yourself the greatest gift you can give yourself. So what if? What if this is the way? What if it's not my works? What if it's not my idols? What if it's not me trying to reach God? What if Jesus has already done this for me? C.S. Lewis says this, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately, impor uh, moderately important. Jesus promises that if we follow him, we will have joy. Not situational joy, but an eternal, enduring, everlasting joy. That at the end of the day, God will have the final say. Death will not have the final say. Divorce will not have the final say. Listen to me, sickness will not have the final say. Depression will not have the final say. Darkness will not have the final say. Jesus will have the final say. And here's what he says. I am for you, not against you. I am for you, not against you. I am for you, not against you. Culture says it's about his rules. It's about religiosity. It's about trying to be good enough. Jesus says, come to me just as you are. I will love you. I will transform you. I will restore you. And I will give you eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that we can come to your word. Counter the lies of culture with the truth of scripture. Today we've talked about and declared the truth that Paul stood thousands of years ago in Athens and declared that God has raised Jesus from the dead for the salvation of all of humanity. That one day he will stand in judgment over everyone, not based on our works, but based on what we did with his grace, his love, his forgiveness. Lord, today, help us in this room, in rooms across Canada, and online, help us embrace, receive, accept the free gift of the unmerited grace and favor of Jesus to us. Amen. Would you please stand as we worship?
Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through generations
Hey, thanks for joining us this Sunday. We hope you enjoyed the opening sermon on our series, Lies. As we're thinking up through false ideas that maybe work their way into our own lives and how we think about religion, God, and faith. We Hopefully it's been challenging for you. Look, if you've been partnering with us in any way, you've been engaging with our content, or maybe you've been attending one of our services, we're so thankful to have you. I really want to encourage you, if you call Village Church home, to engage by participating with your resources as well. It's part of our discipleship as followers of Jesus. So if you haven't had a chance to do that, you can go online at thisisvillagechurch.com slash give. We would love to appreciate your resources as we move the mission of Jesus forward at Village Church. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you back next time.